The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion No. 505 in the name of Jackie Bailey on Save Our Services. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press your request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Jackie Bailey to open the debate. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I very much welcome the opportunity to hold a debate on the proposed cuts to health services across Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and specifically those proposed at the Vale of Leven Hospital. I know that other colleagues will cover the cuts to the children's ward at the Royal Alexandra Hospital, the cuts to maternity services at the Clyde, the cuts to inpatient facilities at the Centre for Integrative Care, and of course, the closure of Lightburn Hospital. All of these cuts were highlighted in January this year, and now they are back today with a vengeance. And let me take this opportunity, presiding officer, to welcome campaigners from across the country, and indeed from my local area, to the chamber today. I want to single out Hospital Watch and the Lennox Herald for their consistent campaign on protecting local health services in my area, and welcome Mark McLean as a very lonely figure in the press gallery. Six months ago, we stood in this chamber and debated cuts to our local health services. At that time, the SNP government said there was nothing to worry about. We were wrong. The leaked health board paper had no standing. Basically, there was nothing to see here. In the run-up to the election, the attack on us became even more shrill. We were liars. We were simply scaremongering. Promises were made to local communities, including my own, by SNP candidates, the Health Minister, and even the First Minister. And let me read you Shona Robson's quote, because I like to keep election leaflets, presiding officer, to see what promises were made. This was popped through the door of every household in Dumbarton constituency during the election. And let me read from it. I have been consistently clear, these are the words of Shona Robson, that this government sees a bright future for the hospital, which plays a crucial role in the local healthcare system. I will not approve any move away from delivery of the vision for the Vale Agreement. And let me say, I absolutely support that. She has been abundantly clear, but somehow I don't think the health board have quite got the message. So the suspicion in my community is that there is a deal struck behind the scenes. Now in 2009, I wholeheartedly welcomed the vision for the Vale. It contained commitments to a whole range of services to be delivered at the local hospital. And whilst we have seen staff numbers drop and a substantial number of clinics cancelled, the vision still remains an important commitment for local people in my community. So important was the community midwifery unit for the Vale vision, it was actually pictured on the very front page. Again, I like to keep government documents. You never know when they'll become useful. The exact wording was that the community maternity unit will be sustained and promoted. This is the very same maternity unit, presiding officer, that is up for closure today. The number of births at the CMU has fallen sharply in the last year, despite the actual birth rate for women remaining steady. Since 2009, the number of births to women resident in Dumbarton, Vale of Leven and Helensborough has fallen by only 8%, while the number of deliveries taking place at the Vale of Leven CMU has fallen by nearly 70%, the largest decrease occurring between 2014 and 15. This suggests to me that the Health Board has not been serious about promoting the CMU to local women, and that takes me on to their marketing activity. The Health Board's marketing plan promised to promote the CMU with media releases, highlighting the positive achievements, editorial briefings, case studies, with volunteer mothers speaking out in support. However, just take a search of the online archives of the Lennox Herald, because that shows there are only five positive stories about the Vale CMU between 2008 and 2011. This was outnumbered by stories about the Health Board reducing the opening hours, midwives being redeployed to the RAH, and campaigners fighting against threats to local health service. Where were the pictures of the newborn babies we all like to see 
in our local papers. We were also promised leaflets, posters, information for GPs across a wide catchment area. Over the summer, I contacted every GP practice in Dumbarton, Vale of Leven, Helensburgh, Lowman, Clydebank, Bearsden, and Mulgai. They were asked to respond to a survey on marketing activity for the CMU. Almost half responded, covering every geographical area. Three quarters of the GPs were not even aware of any, any marketing activity for the CMU. None of the GPs currently have any information leaflets. None of them have posters on the walls of their surgeries to promote the Vale unit. And at the Vale Hospital reception, not a leaflet to be had. The health board has completely failed to promote the unit, which was something we were promised. And then along came the new centralized maternity booking service introduced in June 2014. Cutting out the GP, diverting newly pregnant women to a call centre based at the Southern General Hospital. And surprise, surprise, presiding officer, this coincided with a 57% drop in the number of babies born at the Vale of Leven Hospital, even though for that year, the total number of births by local mums actually rose by 6%. 77 babies born at the Vale in 2013-14 compared to 33 in 2014-15 and down to a handful now. I accuse the government of closing it by stealth. In May 2010, the CMU was downgraded from a 24-hour service to an 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. service with midwives on call during the night. The negative publicity generated by the health board's changes further undermined confidence in the unit. So please, please don't tell me that this is about safety. I have demonstrated that the actions of the Health Board have contributed to undermining the community maternity unit. And I hope the government is not really suggesting that CMUs across the country, of which there are many, are unsafe. The Health Board has not committed to a formal public consultation with service users and the wider public. Instead, we have an engagement strategy an engagement strategy that's based on a consultation conducted almost a decade ago. You just cannot be serious. We need a full three-month consultation with public meetings so people have a genuine opportunity to make their voice heard. Now, I absolutely want to believe the Health Sec Secretary and the government when they say that there will be no cuts at the Vale. I really do want them to fulfill that promise. So if the Health Secretary's commitment is true, then why has not one single SNP MSP signed my motion? Not even George Adam, Stuart McMillan, Ivan McKee or Gil Patterson, who have a direct interest in this area. If the Health Secretary's commitment is true, then why has this not been designated as a major service change? And I would be pleased to hear from the, the Minister um, when she sums up, because if it's designated as a major service change, then it must come to ministers for final sign-off. It would simply not be acceptable for the Health Secretary to say that this is a matter for the Health Board, as this will certainly sound the death knell for the Vale Maternity Unit as sure as night follows day. Finally, Presiding Officer, if the Health Secretary is saying that there will be no cuts at the Vale, then why on earth are we having a consultation which is both both pointless and expensive. There really is only one thing left to say. Save our services, deliver what you promised just six months ago, and stop the cuts. Now move to open speeches of around four minutes, please. Uh, Stuart McMillan to be followed by Anna Sarwarth. Thank you very much, presenting officer. Presenting officer, there's no doubt in my mind that the second decade of the 21st century is a pivotal moment for healthcare and healthcare systems, not just in Scotland but around the world. Uh, an ageing population, a shift to more multidisciplinary working, and rapid advances in research and technology to cite just some of the trends we see to present challenges and opportunities that the founders of the NHS could scarcely have imagined. It's the decisions that we take today on research on the organisation of our NHS on relationships between investments in social, community, primary and secondary care, and on the education and training of the health and social care workforce of the future that will determine 
how well our health service responds to these challenges and opportunities. People in Scotland should uh, get the care and support they need in the right place at the right time, which is why we are transforming our health and social care system to make sure it keeps pace with Scotland's changing needs. But notwithstanding that, presiding officer, I support the IRH and the community midwife unit. I have campaigned to, to save services in the past and I will do so again on social media. Uh, I posted a consultation a document that Jackie Bailey was uh, alluding to. Uh, I posted that last week to encourage people to get involved. I'm meeting with the chief executive and the chair of the, of the health board this week and I'll be meeting with the cabinet secretary for health later this month. I have been and I will continue to raise the issue to encourage the electorate to get involved to make their thoughts known. Despite the cuts to the Scottish Government's budget from the UK Government since 2010, uh, <coughs> the, the Audit Scotland report, NHS in Scotland 2015, found health uh, resource spending has increased in real terms. Audit Scotland confirms that there has been a real terms resource increase in every single year from 2008-9 to 2014-15. And capital spending from Westminster has been cut by 25% to the Scottish Government. However, as, as per the Scottish Government's commitment, uh, resource spending has increased in real terms and Audit Scotland has confirmed that. And Scotland has a record high NHS workforce and continues to advance uh, in diagnosis, treatment and care. Now, Jackie Bailey uh, spoke there about the, uh, about the, the past and certainly the, the, the campaign uh, that certainly took place uh, in 2008. Now, that certainly was a campaign uh, that Jackie Bailey, others and myself, uh, we, in terms of the parliamentarians, uh, we were successful uh, in maintaining the community midwife units uh, and it's certainly something that, uh, that I, uh, I would like to see the community midwife units maintained uh, going forward. But, presiding officer, we, we can't forget uh, that it was under the previous Labour and Liberal Democrat executive that the cuts agenda started. We lost a consultant-led maternity service in 2003 and that's when the issues of, of the maternity units actually started to happen. In 2008, the review uh, took place, and as I said, Jackie Bailey, others, and myself, uh, we, we were successful in campaigning to save the current formulation of the community midwife units. Okay. Jackie Bailey. Um, I think our communities wouldn't forgive us if we simply sought to blame each other for things that happened in the past, or indeed are currently happening. Will he join together with me to resist these cuts, and perhaps explain why he found it so difficult to support my motion? Stuart McMillan. <coughs> uh, I must admit, I genuinely do uh, appreciate uh, the contributions from, uh, from Jackie Bailey and the Chamber. Uh, but uh, I have already said in this, in this particular speech, and I have said on the record, uh, outside of the Parliament, that I will be campaigning, and I, I am campaigning, to save the community midwife unit at the Inverclyde Royal Hospital. And I cannot be any clearer than that, uh, Ms Bailey. Uh, certainly, signing off, sir. The NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board has a record high budget of over £2 billion, which has increased by over 27% under this government. But nevertheless, it has been announced uh, that the board are to press ahead with further scrutiny of the proposals that do include the closure of seven inpatient beds at the Centre for Integrative Care, the community maternity units at the IRH, and also the Vale of Leven in Alexandria. Whilst it is clear that the antenatal and postnatal services uh, at the Rankin and Greenock will remain, the Health Board have proposed to cease birthing services at the IRH. Now, there are typically 30 members of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, most of which are made up of health and finance professionals. The seven remaining members are, are, labour, are, are labour councillors, one representative from each local authority in the Health Board area. But once again, uh, we've seen evidence that, unfortunately, the week before the Health You'll Board took the decision... have I am, to hurry along, Mr McMillan. Uh, the week before... The Health Board put forward the proposals. The, the, the representative from Inverclyde resigned from the Health Board, therefore leaving Inverclyde with no voice on that particular board and taking uh, that decision. But to conclude with, presiding officer, yes, please. Uh, I'll certainly I will take no lessons, no lessons from the Labour Party on NHS cuts, and I will always stand for services being delivered at local level. I've got that record in the past, and I will continue to have that record going forward. Thank you. Anna Sarwar to be followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by paying tribute to Jackie Bailey for securing this debate today and also thanking her for her commitment to the Vale of Leven. I know uh, local people in Dumbarton and indeed those campaigners at the Vale 
appreciate all our efforts in this parliament and beyond. I also want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to all the campaigners of all these services right across uh, the west of Scotland and beyond who are dedicating so much of their time to protect the local community uh, services. And I also want to put on record my thanks to our hardworking and dedicated NHS staff. The pressures and the failures we see in our NHS is despite our staff rather than because of our staff who are undervalued, under-resourced and overworked by this government. Uh, I've got to say, Deputy President Officer, I'm quite uh, disappointed after hearing Mr McMillan's speech today. You'd think that his party hadn't been in government for almost 10 years. You'd think that health wasn't devolved. You'd think that maybe someone else was in control of our NHS. The reality is the NHS is already independent in Scotland. This Parliament and this Scottish Government sets the NHS's budget, sets its priorities and oversees its delivery. If there is any failure in the NHS, if there is any failure in the services of our NHS, it is failures by this government and to try and blame somebody else is simply shameful. And let me just say about those seven Labour councillors on the health board, all seven Labour councillors unanimously oppose these cuts that are coming from the health board. But the reality is the, other, the rest of the health board is appointed by the Scottish Government and it's them that need to up their game. I'm happy to take the intervention. Stuart McMillan. I thank Anna Sarwell for taking the, the, this intervention. But Mr Sarwell will be aware that the week before this proposal was put forward and it was published, the one Labour councillor resigned, the Labour councillor from Inverclyde Council, therefore leaving no Inverclyde voice on that, uh, on that particular committee meeting. Anna Sarwell. Mr McMillan says that he is a voice for Inverclyde. Let's hear what that voice said during the election campaign. He called the Labour candidate, Siobhan McCready, pretty much a liar for bringing up the cuts that were coming at Inverclyde. And I quote, he said she is playing carelessly with the Inverclyde population by indulging in unfounded information about threats to health services, which she has gleaned from informal conversations with friends. Perhaps Mr McMillan should have conversations with friends across Inverclyde who are disappointed in his failure to stand up to his own government and his failure to protect services at Inverclyde Hospital. The reality is that FOI responses from this party have found that we face almost £1 billion of cuts to our NHS over the next four years. But what was this government's response? Not to own up to the fact that we actually do have challenges in our NHS, but instead to say there are no cuts and to go on and say that anyone that suggests they are is being completely false. That is FOIs from health boards right across the country. The reality is that this government should go and speak to the campaigners at all these hospital services right across the country. To the veil of leaving, Jackie Bailey was called a liar during the election campaign for saying that the, that the maternity unit at uh, veil of leaving was under threat. She's been proved to be right. The, the hardworking campaigners in the audience deserve their time with the health minister so she can explain why they were lied to during the election campaign. The camp I've already mentioned uh, in Verclyde, Siobhan McCready was labelled a liar for talking about the proposed closure of maternity services at the, vale of Le at the uh, in Verclyde Hospital. I think expecting mothers in the west of Scotland deserve better than this. And talking of letting people down, this front page yep. in Inverclyde yep. before the election campaign was our first minister shamelessly saying that there'd be no cuts to services at Inverclyde, holding up a newspaper to try and win votes. But what's happened now? There are proposed cuts and closures at the Inverclyde Hospital. This government can't run away from their failures on this. And what about in Paisley? Neil Bibby was accused of being a liar for saying that there's a potential downgrading of paediatric services at the Royal Alexandra Hospital. What's happened now? We've seen the facts that there are proposals to downgrade that service and mothers and families deserve better in Paisley too. Same with the Monklands you must and close same now, at the CIC Centre. We, our patients deserve better and our NHS staff deserve better too. Could I ask, please sit down at the moment, Mr Cameron, could I ask those in the public gallery not to be clapping or shouting out loud? Or Not that you have shouted out loud so far, but just in case. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Cameron, please, uh, followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I appreciate the opportunity to speak 
uh, on this motion presented by Jackie Bailey on, on an issue that I know is of huge significance, not simply to colleagues who represent constituents in the west of Scotland, but more importantly to the people of Western Bartonshire themselves, who have utilised the fantastic services provided by staff at the CMU at the Vale of Leven for many years. Representing the Highlands and Islands, I am also acutely aware that it's a service that has been used by people in my own region, such as in Argyll and Butte. The Vale of Leven has a wider geographic reach than might first be imagined. Now, the Scottish Government's programme for government continually reinforces the point about the need for the NHS to be more community orientated. In fact, the first of the four priorities for the coming year is to, and I quote, empower a truly community health service and to deliver the reforms needed for successful community health services. With that in mind, it is understandable why so many people will be puzzled that the Scottish Government's idea of delivering more community health services is to sit on its hands as the CMU is likely to be closed and expecting mothers are told to make anywhere between an extra half hour to an hour journey to Paisley or Glasgow instead. That isn't building more community-led services, it's dismantling them. And that is rightly a matter of grave concern. Among some of the reasons that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde have presented in favour of closure, I'm sorry, I only got four minutes. I can give you the extra time if you wish, well, Mr Cameron. I'll take the intervention. Aileen Campbell. Uh, to clarify for Mr Cameron, that under the board's proposals, there's no, uh, no closure of the CMUs. I think he uh, inaccurately stated that there would be. It is likely to Don be closed. I said it is likely to be closed. Among some of the reasons that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde have presented in favour of closure is an issue that the Scottish Conservatives have been raising for some time, namely the issue of short staffing, an issue which cuts across the NHS. In fact, the, board, the Health Board's paper on this matter notes that they are, and I quote, finding it difficult to recruit to the CMUs as you need experienced staff who live close enough to attend when a woman presents in labour. Now, with a 16% rise in the number of nursing and midwifery vacancies across Scotland in the three months leading up to June, it is no wonder that such a vital service will struggle to cope with demand. A staffing crisis which lies at the door of the party which has run the NHS in Scotland for the last nine years. In 2009, the vision for the Vale was published and it stated very clearly that the CMU facilities at the Vale of Leven would be protected until 2011. Even as recently as June 2016, the First Minister herself stated that we will not approve proposals that run counter to the vision for the Vale. Despite these warm words, not a single SNP MSP has given their support to Jackie Bailey's motion, and there must be questions about the commitments that have been made by this government to the CMU. Stuart Macmillan attempted to contrast the Scottish Government with the UK Government. Well, let me draw my own contrast. It is well known that NHS spending in England has increased by more than it has on the NHS in Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is clear from the near 2,000 people who have signed the petition to prevent closure that this is a heartfelt issue in the Western Bartonshire area. And although the Health Board has launched a re-engagement process, it needs to ensure that it doesn't just become a talking shop where the outcome has already been decided. This has to be an open process and truly reflect the feelings of respondents, many of whom will have used this service firsthand. If the Scottish Government is truly committed to the vision for the Vale and is truly committed to promoting more community-based services, then they will join me and the SNP will join me, my colleagues and others across this chamber and support Jackie Bailey's motion today and I commend her for her persistence in pursuing this matter. Uh, before I call Mr Bibby, um, I do have quite a few members who wish to speak in this debate, so I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. I now invite Jackie Bailey to move that motion. I'm happy to move, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. So do members agree to extend the debate this evening? All these happy faces. <laughs> I now call Mr Bibby, pleased to be followed by Gil Patterson. Thank you, President Officer, and to Jackie Bailey for bringing forward this important debate. This morning, this morning I met with dozens of parents and grandparents at the RAH in Paisley, along with Kezia Dugdale. All of these people rely on local NHS services, and I can tell the Scottish Government that they echo the thousands of people in Paisley who have already signed petitions to defend the children's ward 
at the RAH. Once again, the message was loud and clear. The SNP government needs to stop their cuts to our local NHS. The transferring of inpatient paediatrics from the RAH to Glasgow represents the closing of the children's ward as we know it and a closure to thousands of children who need it. We know there's been uncertainty over the future of the children's ward at the RAH for many months, but the difference between this debate and the previous debate is that we are now not discussing proposals, we are now discussing the official plan. And Anas Sawar is quite right. Before the election, SNP politicians said Labour were scaremongering for highlighting these proposed cuts. SNP politicians like George Adam, who described the threat to the RAH children's ward as a fantasy and in January and in March even told me that I should stop campaigning to protect it alongside the local families in Paisley. Through his actions he's shown it's obvious that he's been more interested in saving his own job than saving the children's ward at the RAH and I hope at some point uh, he will take the opportunity to sell us if he simply couldn't understand what these proposals meant for the RAH or if he was deliberately trying to hide the truth from the people of Paisley before the election. The time for the SNP government to, to, is, is time for the SNP government to come off the fence and it's that time is well and truly over. I reiterate my call to the Health Secretary once again to come to Paisley and meet with local parents and grandparents. The Health Secretary should be under no illusion about just how important the RAH Children's Ward is to local families. President Officer, the concern for local NHS services that has been mentioned is not just felt in Renfrewshire and Western Bartonshire, but in Inverclyde as well. I've heard from many people in Inverclyde in recent weeks who are extremely concerned by the centralisation agenda which is affecting local NHS services. We again warned people earlier this year that there was to be a review of maternity service and exposed that it could affect local provision. Again, all we heard from the SNP was accusations that we were scaremongering. And now we see that the birthing unit at Inverclyde Royal Hospital is also to be axed. And as Jackie Bailey has rightly said about the veil, the birthing unit in Inverclyde should be maintained and it should be supported to provide a service to more mothers and not be closing its doors. So I also call on the Scottish Government and Health Secretary to intervene now, provide the Health Board with the resources needed and stop the plans to close the Inverclyde birthing unit. Local families will be amazed that the government hasn't already done this, given that last year Nicola Sturgeon was on the front page of the Greenock Telegraph, promising that Inverclyde Hospital was safe and saying that, and I quote, there are no plans to centralise services out of Inverclyde. Again, the reality is that we have been, there's been a number of services transferred from Inverclyde Royal Hospital to Glasgow recently, and the removal of the birthing unit is the latest example of the hospitals downgrading. These cuts are leaving people with a real fear about the sustainability in the long term of the hospital. Presiding officer, we've been here before. The Scottish Government wrongly denied there were proposals to cut and close hospital services. Well, we're not discussing proposals anymore. They are now official plans. In closing, it may be now past five o'clock, presiding officer, but it's decision time for the SNP government. It's time for them to stop sitting on their hands, watching as these services are cut back. My message on behalf of my constituents is clear. The future of our local hospitals depends on keeping these key services. Stop saying you're protecting NHS budgets when you aren't. Stop saying you'll keep health services local Please when you close won't. Mr. Bibby. And giving the health board the, the necessary resources they need. Give families in Renfrewshire and Inverclyde the guarantees they want over their local NHS services. Gil Patterson to be followed by Alex Rowley. Yeah, thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, for the purposes of the time and my speech, I am going to stay focused on the veil of Leiden Hospital uh, and as part of the, the motion. Presiding officer, history doesn't bode well for, the labor, for labor when it comes to the NHS and specifically the veil of Leiden Hospital. In 2009, the vision for the veil ended a decade of damaging uncertainty for the veil of Leiden Hospital and the erosion of services by the previous Labour-led Scottish administration, including the A&E services. 
The then Cabinet Secretary of Health and now the First Minister made a commitment then to protect the Vale in just this year in front of 400 people. And on camera in Western Battenshire, the First Minister made the same commitment to the Vale of Leiden Hospital. And if that's not enough, the Cabinet Secretary in front of this Parliament, the public, and again on camera, reiterated the commitment to the, to, of the Scottish Government to the Vale of Leiden Hospital remaining open. Of course. Jackie Bailey. And, and I agree that that's all very helpful, and I do want you know, to agree with both the First Minister and the Health Secretary about the Vale Hospital. Can I therefore ask... Gil Patterson, why is it we have these proposals before us today? And does he support my very specific call that this should be designated a major service change so it's signed off by the very ministers who have said they will protect the veil? Gil Patterson. Well, you know, I, I hear this said, and, you know, if it was another situation, uh, uh, first, uh, sorry, presiding officer, or in any other any other element of the health board, if the government was telling health boards, dominated by the Labour Party, to do one thing or do another, it, it's not how it works. The, the, the government will be involved once this process takes place, not at this pe present time. And they would be up in arms, and so would, the, so would all the other opposition MSPs, if the government willy-nilly interfered with health boards. That's what, they, that's what their job is. I've, I've just answered you, Jackie. I've answered you. Okay. No, no, that's the answer I'm giving you, Jackie. Okay. So, well, thanks very much for that. Would you two stop having a spat? You can take it outside after the debate. I, Mr. Patterson, please. I apologise. Uh, it's not like me, uh, Presiding Officer. As it stands, the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board is carrying out a review of services. And I do welcome the Scottish Government's view that it would be unacceptable if any proposals were not consistent with the national policy, such as the review of maternity services that has been carried out, and considers that any proposals must be subject to proper and meaningful engagement with people affected. The motion asks for the Cabinet Secretary to intervene. However, NHA, NHA's Greater Glasgow and Clyde Board have already initiated a consultation period and we need to encourage everyone, everyone with a vested interest to engage with this process. For me, with the consultation, there is a serious question that arises in regards to the community maternity unit at the Vale of Leaven Hospital. The Vale of Leaven, Leaven uh, uh, Hospital and Inverclyde provide a wide range of maternity care to all women in each locality, seeing 5,000 non-birth uh, uh, contacts each year, which in my view is very, very positive news indeed. However, the figures in regards to the Vale's baby delivery services are shockingly low. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde had a planned figure of 200 births per year, and in 2015 and 16, the figure stood at just 43, less than one a week, peaking at 112 way back in 2009. It must be reminded that mothers are consistently advised during the pregnancy, pregnancy by midwives and other medical professionals, included, included what happens when complications arise. There is a concern that with fewer women who meet low risk criteria, the higher the chance of complications and it would seem mothers are voting with their feet. You have Using to close the now, for Mr. Patterson. Sorry? Come to a close now. Please. I will do, uh, uh, President Officer. Uh, the veil of, uh, using the veil for all other maternity services, but opting out to have their delivery carried uh, elsewhere. These figures need to be analysed, and the question needs to be asked, why the vast majority of mothers in the Vale area are not using the unit for delivery. I want to know, just, not just as an MSP, but as a father and a grandfather. Mr Patterson. However, I'll, I'll close well there, over time. First Minister. I did take quite a lot of interruptions. No, Mr anyway. Patterson, you're well over time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, well, you've got a clap anyway. <laughs> Can I um, remind members that they shouldn't be making interventions until they're so directed by the chair? 
whether that be when they stand up to try and make a formal one or whether it be muttering from their seats. Uh, thank you very much. And I call Alex Rowley, followed by Morris Corey. President officer, thank you very much. Uh, as the lone Pfeiffer in this debate, I wanted to very briefly um, support Jackie Bailey and congratulate her on bringing this motion forward. Because I think what we're seeing here is a lesson to people throughout Scotland in terms of the centralisation of services. And right across Scotland, we are seeing cuts taking place. And that would be my first point that I would want to touch on, is that I think there needs to be transparency, openness and honesty from the government in terms of the cuts that are taking place in health services across Scotland. Because the question that I have when I look at this is, what is it that's driving this review? And if the review is being driven by cuts, then the result will be a centralisation of services to save money. And I wanted to quote from Fife, uh, from the Director of Finance in Fife, who earlier this year, where the, the NHS board said that they were going to have to cut £30.8 million from their budget. And what she said was, the extent of the challenges faced was unprecedented, both locally and across the NHS in Scotland as a whole. I have not seen the scale of these financial challenges in my whole career. And that was reported in the local press. And if that is the case, then there needs to be, as I say, transparency and honesty about the level of cuts that our health service is facing, uh, rather than hiding behind reviews and then the centralisation of services. And the second point that I would like to make that's mentioned in the, the motion is the extensive public engagement. And we need to ensure that where there is engagement taking place, that it's taking place properly. The Scottish Government have standards for engagement. And that, that engagement needs to start with all the facts being placed on the table. So I would mo make those two points to the Minister. We need to know the extent of cuts that are taking place here and elsewhere so we can understand what is driving these reviews and we need proper consultation. At that, I would thank Jackie Aileen Bailey. Campbell. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Rowley, I just wanted to reiterate that there is record investment in the NHS. We understand there are challenges. And it's right, though, that NHS boards do review just to make sure that the services that they provide are the right ones. But I do agree, and I take on board the point, though, that engagement and uh, openness needs to be part of the process. But I would want to just reiterate that it would be... Um, it would, it would, it's ordinary for NHS boards to look and review their services, and would you not agree that that's part and parcel of making sure that we've got the smooth running of our NHS? Alex Rowley. Well, yeah, I would, I, I, I would agree if, if it's clear what's driving those reviews, because in, where this Director of Finance says, I have not seen the scale of these financial challenges in my whole career, and there are massive cuts been imposed and that would be my final point the government can't simply sit behind or hide behind local health boards because it is the government that is saying to local health boards that they have to cut their budgets and that's where we need the openness and the transparency but i congratulate jackie bailey and i wish her and and all colleagues and all parts of this chamber that are going to fight for these services every success Morris Corey to be followed by Ivan McKee. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, for the opportunity to speak in tonight's debate on this very important issue to many of my constituents in the west, Scot west of Scotland, um, covering in particular the Western Berkshire area and Argyll and Butte. It is a testament to the strength of feeling about this issue that I congratulate Jackie Bailey on bringing this to the Chamber today uh, and her motion, which we are debating in this Chamber and it has a support from right across the political spectrum of this chamber itself, ex except, of course, from that of any SNP member of the parliament. I have to declare an interest in that all four of my children uh, were born, including twins, at the Vale of Leven Hospital uh, in the CMU unit in the 90s, and we would receive them as fantastic support there, on some cases, some difficult circumstances. 
This issue has also attracted the support of nearly 2,000 people in the west of Scotland who have signed a petition trying to prevent the closure of services at the Vale of Leven Hospital and that it is a clear indication of support that exists in the community at large for the services provided at the hospital. Their views must be listened to and considered when making any decision about the future of this hospital. I would ask that the pending increase of the 2,000 Royal Naval personnel at Faz Lane and their families and their needs for medical support locally are considered seriously by the Scottish Government in their reviews. I believe the public are making it clear how they feel about the proposals and I welcome the decision to launch a re-engagement process but only if it is open and fair uh, and which really wants to hear what the local people think should be the future of the hospital and its wonderful NHS staff. I don't believe there is any point in pretending to engage with the public if a decision has already been taken behind closed doors and the views of the public are just going to be disregarded. It would be disingenuous and a complete waste of public resources. This February, the Cabinet Secretary of Health and Sport said that the vision of the veil vale remains key for this hospital and making sure that it's delivered. And when, this June, when in this June this year, the First Minister promised that her government would, wouldn't approve proposals that run counter to the vision for the veil. Vale. I think that the people in Western Bartonshire and Argyll and Butte would have rightly assumed that those statements would mean that the government and the SNP would be against any proposals to close the community maternity unit at the hospital. It once again begs the question of why no SNP member has given their support to this motion. The statements of the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport were a promise made to the public who rely on their hospital, a promise made to the people of the West of Scotland by this government. So I truly hope that the government will decide to honour that promise. Thank you. Ivan Key to be followed by James Kelly. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, this document here is the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, Paper 1645 that purports to lay out the case for the closure of Lightburn Hospital. I attended the Health Board meeting on the 16th of August when this paper was first presented. I was there along with the Save Lightburn campaign. I met separately with the directors of the Health Board along with representatives in that meeting of Save Lightburn campaign and of Parkinson's UK to review the case made in this paper in more detail. And in my mind, having looked at it, this paper fails to make a case for the closure of Lightburn. The data in here is more Use more for support than illumination. Sure. Anna Sarai. I thank the member for giving um, uh, an intervention. Will he accept that it was wrong for the local SNP MP to use parliamentary resources during the election campaign to write to voters in his constituency to say that there were no plans to close Lightburn Hospital and to quote, to say it was a desperate pitch from Paul Martin who's attempting to stand shoulder to shoulder with locals against closure of a hospital that isn't closing? Can you take that back and apologise to local people? I've got in my hand a letter that I put out during that election campaign which says nothing of the sort. My letter laid out clearly to the constituents the process that has to be gone through before the closure would take place, which is the process that we're going through just now. So, just moving on. So I said the data in here, I'm taking from a one day sample and end destinations for inpatients and covers all of the hospitals in the East End of Glasgow, not just Lightburn, leaving us none the wiser as to their relevance or implications. No data is presented to back up the claim that the plans to move services will deliver improved outcomes for patients and no data is provided and how often services not currently provided for at Lightburn require to be accessed by inpatients there, which is a key part of the board's argument for closure. The board plans to move outpatient services from Lightburn to a new proposed health hub at Parkhead, despite there being no timescale for its construction and none of the th required £32 million in funding in place. And all questions asked the, the, the board about the proposed hub, they directed me to an IJB, a case of integration being used as a vehicle to shift responsibility rather than share it. No clarity is given as to what measures will be put in place to cover the period when the, between the proposed closure of Lightburn and the hoped for construction of the new facility. The Lightburn site in the meantime has suffered significant underinvestment. Recently part of the site was boarded up, which apart from being an eyesore, sends a signal that the site and the patients it serves are undervalued. Lightburn serves a local community in the east end of Glasgow with a high proportion of elderly residents. Recovery rates are better when patients are closer to family and friends who can benefit from frequent visits. Yet the plan to relocate rehabilitation and patient services to the other end of the city presents often elderly visitors with challenges in terms of transport. 
We often hear about tackling health inequality, shifting resources to the most deprived communities, yet the plan to close the light burn by the health club does precisely the opposite, removing resources from an area which contains three of the four most deprived areas, according to the recent survey of multiple deprivation. The Health Board paper stresses the importance of the strategic shift from acute services to the community, yet this document proposes a transfer of services away from a hospital located in the heart of the community to a large acute hospital some distance away. The Board have also made it clear that the final decision on Lightburn has not been made, and have stated on several occasions that their proposal is not based on financial considerations, but on clinical factors alone. The public engagement on Lightburn's future is now started and the public will have their say on this local service and I urge all those with an interest in local communities to take part in this process. The answer to shifting the focus of service delivery from acute to the community is not to close a hospital in the community and move patients undergoing rehabilitation to a large acute hospital some distance away. The answer to tackling health inequalities is not to shift resources from the most deprived communities to the centre. The answer to improving outcomes for patients is not to move them away from friends and family, reducing rather improving their outcomes. And the answer to improving health service provision for the people of East End of Glasgow is not this paper from the Health Board. I now move to the last of the open speeches, uh, James Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Let me congratulate Jackie Bailey on bringing forward this very substantive motion, which has clearly um, touched in a number of constituencies and regions, given by the large number of contributions that we've had to this very important debate. I want to use my contribution to speak up in favour of Lightburn Hospital, as I did at a previous members' debate, in uh, 2013. I know um, from all my own family experience how widely used and valued that hospital is. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's got a priority for elderly services and there's quite a big elderly population around the east end of Glasgow who use the hospital widely. Um, and I think it, uh, it would be really detrimental to that service uh, to move it to the other end of the city because where it is sited just now, just off the Edinburgh Road, is near to the main bus services. And I know that that, is, uh, that, that, that's, that service is widely used by those who access the hospital. It has also uh, got a very valued uh, Parkinson's unit and a, a dedicated Parkinson's resource in that hospital, which is used um, beyond the East End. I know. Um, from a previous position as MSP for Rutherglen, that it was used by a great number of uh, people in Canvas Lang and Rutherglen. So I think that that, that service uh, is very much uh, needed in the East End of Glasgow uh, and beyond, not just the elderly services, but the Parkinson services, and they, they must be maintained. I think the thing that strikes me about this debate and the debate that's taking place if you like, over the last six months, is the absolute brass neck uh, of the SNP. There was a motion that came before the Parliament, before the election, where the SNP told us that it was committed to maintaining and improving uh, safe and effective local services across Scotland, including the REH, Vale of Leaven, Lightburn uh, and St John's. But, you know, sure enough, what happens, the, the election passes by, the cuts roll down, uh, and we start to see uh, these proposed closures. And I think specifically, yeah, I'll take an intervention. Ivan McKee. Is the member not aware that the proposal comes from the Health Board and not from the Scottish Government, and there's a process to be gone through? James Kelly. You, to, you really got to laugh, haven't you? I mean, who's actually running the NHS in Scotland? You know, see, when you listen to this debate, you think, we've had SNP, MSP after MSP stand up and say, it's not really got anything to do with us, you know. We're, <laughs> we, we're only in power. <laughs> Don't ask me to take any responsibility. Uh, but as I say, it is absolutely gone. And, you know, going back to Ivan McKee's election, if you look at what Anne McLaughlin actually said in a letter to constituents on House of Commons new, new, uh, note paper, I have been in touch with the Scottish Government and have received unequivocal, an unequivocal assurance that Lightburn Hospital is under no threat of closure. So what I want to hear from the Minister in the summing up is what communication took place between Anne McLaughlin, the MP for Glasgow North East and the Scottish Government, and what 
assurance was Anne McLaughlin given about the closure of Lightburn Hospital? I think it's vital that we know the answers to these questions. And summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, Lightburn is absolutely vital to the East End of Glasgow, and I think it's important that there's a strong campaign to save that. But I think it's also important that the SNP actually start to take responsibility for some of the decisions that they're taking uh, and stand up and be counted on this issue. Let's save, let's save Lightburn. Let's save our services. Glasgow deserves better. I now call on Aileen Campbell to wind up the debate. Minister, around eight minutes. Thank you, President Officer. It, it has been a robust debate, and I know all members will contribute their views to the ongoing engagement. And I have genuinely, uh, aside from the uh, robust exchanges, uh, appreciated the personal connections members have highlighted to the services that are important to them. What is not in question is the level of prior priority afforded to the safe stewardship of the NHS by the people of Scotland. There are no public services that are valued higher, and I want to put on record the government's sincere appreciation for the unstinting professionalism and commitment shown by those who work so tirelessly in our health and social care services. Turning to Jackie Bailey's motion, I think it would, though, be helpful to establish some facts. Firstly, contrary to what is stated in the motion, no decisions have been made about the service change proposals mentioned. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde... Jackie Bailey. And I thank the Minister for taking an intervention. Um, can I ask the Minister, will you designate that the cut proposed for the CMU as a major service change? Because it's not up to the Health Board, it's not up to the Scottish Health Council, it is ultimately a decision for Ministers. Will you insist that that final decision is made by the Health Secretary? As Jackie Minister? Bailey knows, there is a process that has to be gone through, and as I'll outline in my uh, closing remarks, uh, I'll ex elaborate a bit on that, but the member knows that no decision has been taken, and there is a process of engagement ongoing, uh, and I will elaborate on, on that as, as I go through my uh, remarks. NHS Glater, Glasgow and Clyde formalised their proposals at their board meeting in August, and as we would expect, are now in the process of engaging with the affected local communities, staff and other stakeholders so that they can carefully consider their views. And I would encourage local people and their representatives to play a full part in that process. And that will take the form of three months public engagement on the proposals relating to the Centre for Integrative Care, Community Maternity Units and Lightburn Hospital running from September until November. I'm sorry, no, I'm making progress. This will help to inform the Health Board's ongoing work with the independent Scottish Health Council, which includes coming to a view on which of these service changes should be considered major. The board will reconvene following that work, probably at their meeting planned for December, and then will agree the next steps. Should any of the proposals be designated major, then the board must undertake formal public consultation of at least three months, and their final service change proposals will be subject to ministerial approval. In the case of the proposals around transferring paediatric inpatient and day cases from the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Paisley to the new Royal Hospital for Children, the board will discuss the next steps at their meeting in October. The board have already been clear that should they move to proceed with these paediatric proposals, it would represent major service change. Presiding officer, the possibility that some or all of these proposals may change as a result of the public engagement underway and that some or all may ultimately be subject to ministerial approval means it would be inappropriate for me to discuss the specifics in any detail beyond reiterating that it would be unacceptable if any formal proposals are not consistent with national policy such as the review of maternity services that is currently ongoing, a point made well by Gil Patterson and Ivan McKee. Okay. Process, because I understand. Jackie Bailey. Thank you. I understand what she says about substance. Um, let's be clear. We already have the REH designated as a major service change. Can you confirm it is not for the Health Council to decide? The gift of whether this is a major service change or not lies with ministers. As I said, in response previously, there is a process to be gone through that is getting worked through between the NHS boards and the Scottish Health Councils. And if it's considered, then there will be a ministerial uh, intervention. However, I've talked through the process very clearly. Uh, happy to provide that in writing for Miss Bailey if she still doesn't get it. Uh, but I'll uh, continue with the remarks that I want to make. However, I want to be clear. 
that this government remains committed to robust evidence-based policy making as set out in our national clinical strategy. Underpinning this is our long-term commitment to secure local services where possible and develop specialist services when necessary. This will ensure that our health and social care services are responsive to the many challenges and opportunities that we face, from the pressures resulting from demographic change to the continuous advancements in technology. Where change is advocated, we will ensure that the local boards work with all stakeholders to make the case. What we will not countenance is change being dictated to local communities as has happened in the past. A point I think Alec Rowley made in that open engagement is crucial in these uh, service reviews. And I would reiterate that local people can be assured this government will always focus our approach on providing as many services as locally as possible. Okay. Anna Minister Sarmar. for taking that intervention. Can she confirm that the content of Anne McLaughlin MP's letter used on parliamentary resources where she says that she was in direct contact with the Scottish Government, whether she's aware of that direct contact and what the form of that contact was? Aileen Campbell. Probably, I'm not aware of that. Um, I would probably uh, need to uh, look at that uh, after this um, debate. The member is happy to, to write and contact uh, the uh, ministerial team. Uh, Mr Sarwar, I've already asked you not to be speaking from a sedentary position. Please desist. That, as I said, around local, ensuring that we deliver services as locally as possible, that is our record in government, and it, stands, it does stand in stark contrast to that of the previous administration. Now, I note in Jackie Bailey's motion that she calls on ministers to intervene and pledge to work with local communities to prevent the closure of health services. And I think we should reflect, and Stuart McMillan was right to add this within his remarks, we should reflect on what this government has done for such services since 2007, and then compare that with what Labour delivered when they were in power. The very first act of Nicola Sturgeon as Health Secretary in June 20, 2007 was to come to this Parliament and announce we were overturning the previous Labour-led administration's decision to close the highly valued a &E departments at Monklands and Air Hospitals. Since our decision to save these units, they have provided much needed emergency capacity, seeing more than over 830,000 attendances between them. And we've not just maintained these services, we have invested in them and enhanced them. And what of the veil of leaving hospital in Jackie Bailey's constituency? It was this government that ended a decade of damaging uncertainty by approving the vision of, for the veil in 2009, whilst the Labour-led administration that Jackie Bailey served on as a minister presided over the closure. Jackie Bailey presided, her administration presided over the closure of the hospital's A&E department in 2002. Indeed, oh, she may ha sigh, but that unfortunately is the uncomfortable truth that your administration closed the A&E department. Indeed, the approval for the vision for the veil secured its remaining emergency services and meant that key local services, which would have been lost under previous proposals, were safeguarded and they were improved. And in terms of delivering on the commitment to the vision for the veil, I can confirm that inpatient activity has increased 36% when compared with 2009-10, and day case activity has increased by 28%. That's an increase of over 1,000 cases. Emergency attendances have increased by 12% when compared to 2009-10, and we've also invested 21 million in a new primary care centre, which opened on the veil site in 2013. The government has been consistently clear that we remain committed to the vision for the Vale. We continue to see a bright future for the hospital, which plays a crucial role in local healthcare system. Ministers are fully aware of the strength of local feeling in relation to the current proposals about maternity deliveries at the Vale. We received, and I received it today, a petition of around 2,500 signatures from the Lennox Herald this afternoon. And I understand and I know that there are people here tonight in the gallery. And I would once again encourage all local stakeholders to make their feelings clear during the public engagement work which is now underway. I would also add that the Health Board's review will include working with the CMO to look at midwifery services across the region and that we've been clear it would be unacceptable if any final proposals are not consistent with national policy, such as the review of maternity services, which is due to be published later this autumn. Presiding officer, in closing, I want to reiterate this government's absolute commitment to the delivery of high quality, sustainable health and social care services. Such services are not static and our clinical strategies underline our approach to change. 
where the evidence supports this and is as informed by meaningful public engagement. And I know that Ivan McKee will ensure his constituencies, his constituents' voices in regard to Lightburn Hospital will be held during that engagement process. Where there are proposals for major service change in the NHS, they must be subject to formal public consultation and ultimately ministerial approved. Local people can be assured that in all such cases, ministers take all the available information and representations into account before coming to a final de decision. So again, presiding officer, thank you for this debate and I look forward to ensuring that all members get their chance to ensure their constituents' voices are heard in these review processes. May I thank those in the gallery for their courtesy and I now close this meeting.